From Tallahassee, Florida's capital city, North Florida Baptist Church presents the Family Bible Hour. Stay tuned for 60 minutes of beautiful hymns, musical groups, and solos with a special presentation from the North Florida Choir and Orchestra. Hear our pastor, Dr. Randy Ray, as he shares a powerful message from God's Word aimed at encouraging your life. Experience firsthand this time of worship and praise and be challenged by the preaching of God's Word. This is the Family Bible Hour. Thank you for joining us today on the Family Bible Hour. We're looking today at Revelation chapter 14, the entire chapter. It's more like an overview of the book of the Revelation, and uh, I think you'll find it very interesting as we hear seven voices speaking uh, in Revelation chapter 14. We'd love to hear your voice and see your face right here at North Florida Baptist Church. We're located at 3000 North Meridian Road, of course, right here in Tallahassee, Florida. It would be our great joy to have you as our very special guest. Stay with us for all of today's Family Bible Hour.
I picked up a pen and a page And I started writing just what I'd say If we were face to face I'd tell you just what you mean to me Tell you these simple truths Be strong in the Lord and never give up hope you're gonna do great things, I already know God's got his hand on you, so don't live life in fear Forgive and forget, but don't forget why you're here Take your time and pray These are the words I would you were hurting and I felt your pain in my heart and I want to tell you that I keep on praying love will find you where you are I know cause I've already been there so please hear these simple truths be strong in the Lord and never give up hope you're gonna do great things, I already know God's got his hand on you, so don't live life in fear Forgive and forget, but don't forget why you're here Take your time and pray These are the words I would say From one simple life to another You're gonna do great things, I already know God's got his hand on you, so don't live life in fear Forgive and forget, but don't forget why you're here Take your time and pray And thank God for each day His love will find a way These are the words I will so much, Kara. Great music today. I've just really enjoyed everything about the music today, and thank you so much, uh, all of you who participate in our music program. Will you take your Bibles and turn to the book of the Revelation, chapter 14. The book of the Revelation, chapter 14, the title of the message today is Seven Voices. How would the uh, media announce the end of the world? I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of information out there. How would uh, uh, they announce the end of the world? Sports Illustrated would say, uh, game's over. Uh, Ladies Home Journal would say, lose 10 pounds by Judgment Day uh, <laughs> with our new Armageddon diet. Inc. Magazine would say, 10 ways you can profit from the apocalypse. CNN, world ends, women and children most affected. I think that's uh, appropriate. Uh, AOL would say, system temporarily down, try calling back in 15 minutes. And uh, that's just kind of the way that the, the world might announce the end of the world. Most people, when they talk about the end of the world, have no idea what they're speaking of because the end of the world is a, uh, it's really something that's, that's not even an appropriate um, uh, saying. There is the tribulation in this world. There's a transformation of this world. Uh, but it's an interesting thing that they say. This world has a fixation on Armageddon, the final battle of Earth's history. There are books and movies and predictions and possible scenarios looking into the future of what might be and how it might develop. As we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, uh, scientists believe it will come about because of a nuclear meltdown. Most people that think about Armageddon, the apocalypse, the very end, <clears throat> think that it's going to come 
by some nuclear method. No one is really sure how it will come to pass, but there are a few hints in the Scripture. This morning, uh, we are going to see more of John's revelation as we hear seven voices in uh, chapter 14 of the book of the Revelation. Now, let me just give you a way to look at this. This is an overview, a synopsis of the Revelation. This is a synopsis of prophecy. Uh, this is 14 uh, aspects of, of all that we've seen and some of what we're going to see. I remind you also that this has not been a comprehensive study of the book of the Revelation. It will be over in two or three weeks. This has been a, the title of the series was World in Chaos, and the purpose of the series was to touch upon things that, that all of us as believers and non-believers uh, should know concerning what's going to happen uh, in the end times. That being said, let's go to Revelation chapter 14 and look at verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the uh, roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Now there's four voices we're going to see here. And let's start with the first voice. The first voice is the voice of praise. Here we have the vision of Jesus Christ standing in the middle uh, of the, the middle of the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, beside him stand the 144. A thousand with the seal on their foreheads, and understand this is the seal of the name of the Father. This is not what is commonly referred to as the mark of the beast. It's something completely different as given in Revelation 7 and verse 3. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the seal, uh, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. In verse 2 of our text, the voice of God thunders forth with a new song. Uh, a whole new song comes forth from God. I don't know what that song is going to be, but it must be magnificent if God's going to sing it, you know. And so this, this whole new song thunders forth, and, and a new song of praise begins throughout all of, uh, all of heaven. The song of praise comes from the 144,000 sealed of God, 144,000 Jews, which in effect become the, the evangelism tool on this world uh, who, because they have been saved. They, the song they sing is said to be a new song. It's not one that has been sung before, and it's one that can only be sung by this special group of, of people, these 144,000 Jews who have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Messiah. Now, let me just say a word about that that Jews uh, are saved today and can be saved today. And one of the most wonderful things you'll ever find is a Messianic Jew, a Jew who has, uh, uh, has come to an understanding that Jesus Christ really is their Messiah and that Jesus Christ really should be their Savior. There's coming a day when in heaven 144,000 choir of these Jews will sing, uh, these unique Jews saved during the tribulation, they're going to sing and they're going to sing a new song, a song as only they can sing it. Something very interesting about these people is revealed that causes some to make some very interesting suggestions regarding the numbered group. Look at Revelation 14 then again in verse 4. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. Uh, it is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have redeemed from mankind as first fruits of God and the Lamb, and there in the mouth uh, no lie was found, for they are blameless. Now this is an interesting thing. These verses indicate that the 144,000 are men, and men only. doesn't mean only men will be saved, but this is a count of men. 
It doesn't prevent women from being uh, part of the host of the redeemed, but it is 144,000 count of men only. They had put their faith in God, and they'd also kept themselves chaste and pure before Him. And specifically mentioned is that they have not been with women. I don't know the significance of that, but I might say to you that that could be uh, some of some of where uh, Muhammad. Uh, got some of his writing because he, he wrote some things that, that are clearly uh, copied after a, uh, a diversion from Scripture, but clearly some of the things that he wrote were imitations with a twist from Scripture. Maybe this is where he got his, his idea about heaven and the reward uh, in, in heaven. It sounds a little strange to us, but it's not inconsistent with the other events of the Bible. If, if somebody asked me, uh, well, how many uh, were in your church today? I wouldn't say, well, we had uh, this number of men. I, I wouldn't say that. I would say we had this number of people. In fact, I would say we had this number, and it would include uh, people, cats, dogs. Uh, it would include folks that drive by while I'm preaching. It would include everything that I could possibly get. And that's just the way that it is. However, it is not an unusual thing in Scripture when a count is given for it to be just a count of men. There was, first of all, the feeding of the 5,000. And actually, at the feeding of the 5,000, there were more than 5,000 who were fed. In John chapter 6 and verse 10, Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. That's pretty clear. And what of those who believed in uh, Acts chapter 4? The number was measured in men, although many more were saved. Acts chapter 4 and verse 4. And many of those who uh, had heard the word believed, and the number of the men uh, came to about 5,000. Now, you say, Pastor Ray, why? Why do the Scriptures uh, sometimes only measure the number in men? And I want to tell you what every preacher ought to tell you. We don't know. I can't give you the answer to that. I might be able to give you an answer that somebody said is the answer, but I don't know the answer to that. It certainly doesn't mean that women are unimportant. It certainly doesn't mean that children can't be saved. Uh, I, I can't give you the answer as, as to why that is. Uh, I, I could probably give you a better answer as to why voting districts are measured the way that they are uh, than I can to give you that answer. I just flat don't know. God saves men and women, boys and girls. He uses men and women uh, in His service. Uh, the suggestion that this 144,000 may be only men of the congregation is not inconsistent with other New Testament passages. Neither is it a devaluation of the value of women. It just is what it is. It is a reference point. And so see it as a reference point. So there's 144,000. Uh, you might find it significant that they are uh, uh, virgins. Uh, I find it more significant that they are men because clearly there's more than 144,000 who come to know Christ during uh, this aspect of the, the tribulation time. So the first voice of heaven is a voice of praise from people who have a right to praise Him. The second voice of heaven is very familiar. It's the voice of the gospel. Verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him uh, who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. Now today it is neither the privilege nor the duty of angels to preach the gospel. That's now not how the gospel gets out. It's not for angels to preach the gospel. That responsibility has been given to God's people. That responsibility has been given to the church. That responsibility has been given to you and to me. This angel flies around, however, preaching a gospel message much different than angels do today. Angels are protectors. Angels watch over us and so on. There are real angels today, and they are really among us. And I, no doubt there are some that are here uh, today, and I'm talk, not talking about the sweet little lady sitting in the pew. I'm talking about a real, honest-to-goodness angel uh, that's probably uh, somewhere in this room, and probably more than that, there are real angels. There'll come a time when the angels will actually preach a gospel in heaven. Uh, they will preach a good news in heaven. 
And that's what gospel means. It means the good news. Now there's only one gospel, but there are four different vantage points of that gospel as given in the Word of God. Let me give you those four vantage points. First of all, there's the gospel of the kingdom. That's one of the aspects of the voice of the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Those are the words of Jesus. This is the gospel that tells of Christ's reign on this earth. That's the gospel of the kingdom. This is what we have been uh, studying during this series, the gospel of the kingdom. This is what the model prayer is asking for us to do. You may recall back uh, a few years ago, I did a series. The title of the series was Thy Kingdom Come. And the reason that I did that series is because in the model prayer, these words are spoken, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I believe that it's God's will today for us to live out His kingdom on earth the way that we will live it out someday in heaven. And if you go through and read the book of Matthew, you'll see several things where it says the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom is like. And you look at each one of those things and it has reference points to uh, who we are as individuals and reference points to children and so forth and so on and you go through all of that and you get a good picture of what the kingdom is going to be like uh, in heaven and the way that the kingdom ought to be on earth as it is in heaven. One of the gospels that is proclaimed in the Word of God is the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel that we're the most familiar with is the gospel of grace. That's in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. But I do not account my life of any value or as precious to myself if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of our Lord. This is the gospel that we preach today. This is the good news of salvation. This is a gospel that is referred to as the glorious gospel. This is the gospel that you know more than any other gospel. Now it's all the same gospel, but this is the perspective of the gospel. The gospel of the grace, the gospel of the mercy of God. When Jesus told his followers to go into all the world and preach the gospel, he was speaking to you and me and he was talking about the gospel of grace. We are preachers of the gospel. You said, "Mm -mm, not me, I'm a plumber. Uh, You might be a plumber, but if you're saved, you're a preacher of the gospel. You say, not me, I'm an elementary school teacher. You might be an elementary school teacher, but if you're saved, you're supposed to be a preacher of the gospel. Not me, Uh, I I work downtown. Uh, Well, you might work downtown, that's where you're supposed to be, a preacher of the gospel. Here's what the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. We're to take the the commission of Acts 1-8 personally. That's not something that a preacher just ought to preach. In fact, there's nothing that a preacher preaches that ought to just be, uh, you ought to go home and say, well, that was just preaching. Everything about preaching the Word of God is personal. Everything has application. Everything should be taken in. Uh, when you go to a restaurant today, and, and many of you will go to a restaurant today because we start our services at 10 and we beat all the Methodists to the restaurant. So we go to the restaurant. When you go to the restaurant, you'll sit down and you'll order and you'll say, well, there's a nice meal. And you'll look at that meal and then you'll get up and you'll walk away and you'll say to someone, uh, what would you have for lunch? Oh, you know what? To be honest with you, they brought this beautiful plate of, plate of food. How did it taste? Oh, I never took it in. I didn't take it in. I didn't want to make it personal. You know, it's just, it's just food. And uh, I didn't want it to be personal, so I just kind of let it lay there. Well, what happened to it? Well, they threw it away. You mean they threw all that food away that you ordered? Yeah, yeah they did. Well, how come? Well, because I didn't eat it. Why well, didn't you eat it? Well, I just didn't want to take it personally. I want to tell you something. Every word of God is personal to you and to me. We ought to take it personally. We ought not say, well, that's just there. It doesn't count for much. It doesn't mean much. I don't want to fool with it. I don't want to mess with it. It is a serious word for your life and for mine. We're talking about the voice of the gospel. There's the gospel of the kingdom. There's the gospel of grace. And then there's Paul's gospel. Paul took the gospel message so personally that he sometimes called it my gospel. You ever feel that way? I hope you feel that way about your church. Oftentimes people say, "Uh, my church is right over here. I like that when people say my church. I like that sense of of connection. I like that sense of even ownership, if you will. 
Uh, Paul felt such a sense of connection to the gospel that he referred to it as my gospel. He took it personally and referred to it in that way. His gospel is the same gospel as the gospel of grace, but he added emphasis of its availability to all, and he said, this is just how close this is to me. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. When we feel strongly about the gospel, we begin to take it personally. And when we take it personally, we become stewards of it. And when we are stewards of it, then we make sure that it is uh, uh, planted and given out wisely and effectively. Uh, I think that's the way that you are about the valuable things in your life. Uh, whenever uh, you, you get something valuable in your life, whether it's your, your paycheck or, or a car or, or clothes or whatever it may be, uh, you look at it and you say, all right, now I've become the steward of this. This means something to me. Uh, you guys, you'll buy a tie and uh, you, you, go to, uh, you go to a place to eat and you sit down and, and you, you spill something on your tie. And don't tell me you don't take it personally. You like it and you say, oh my goodness gracious, look at what I've done to my tie. Uh, I, I meant to take better care of this. Uh, you may call for something to try and, and get something out of it and so forth, but basically you know that once that you have let down on the stewardship of that tie, that uh, it's pretty much done for. We should feel a personal connection to the gospel like that, that we can't let the gospel down, that we cannot turn our backs on it, that we can't say, oh, it's just the gospel. We don't have to worry about that. It's vitally important. We're looking at seven voices today, and the second voice is the voice of the gospel. That gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. It is the gospel of grace. It is the gospel of the Apostle Paul. And then as referenced in our text, it is the eternal gospel. Verse 6 of Revelation 14, then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth to every nation and tribe and language of people. Now it is a gospel, a judgment. Uh, so how can this be a gospel of good news. How can it be good news? Well, I want to tell you something. It's good news to all of those who have been persecuted for their faith. I thought they were supposed to turn the other cheek. Well, first of all, a lot of people misunderstand turning the other cheek. Turning the other cheek normally means an insult. If somebody, you know, if they slap your face, turn let them slap the other face. But, and and uh, the other side of your face. If, if uh, somebody takes something trivial from you, just say, go ahead and take that and give them something else as well. But it's absolutely not talking about self-defense. Self-defense is a whole different thing. You know, you can slap me on the cheek, and I may turn the other cheek. I think that I would. But you slap my wife on the cheek, I'll stomp a mud hole in you. I'll just do it I, right now. I'll tell you I will. I, I, think, I think that a lot of times we misunderstand uh, the meaning of Scripture. Now, why in the world would these people, uh, why would it be good news that judgment is going to fall on this earth? Well, because they are uh, calling out to God not from a position of grace because they have not suffered. They have not been saved during the day of grace. They've been saved during the day of, of tribulation. The tribulation saints are not living in this grace and mercy time. They're living in torment and suffering time. And they've called out to God and asked Him, when will you avenge us? They've asked, when will you, when will you uh, uh, pay retribution on those who have suffered, uh, caused us to suffer so? And that, that angel says, let me tell you the eternal gospel, it's coming. Don't you worry about it. That same God of grace is a God of judgment. And, and God is, is going to avenge uh, your blood. God loves you so much. How could a God of love judge? Because he loved the people who were suffering. So those are the voices of the gospel. You have the voice of praise. You have the voice of the gospel. And then thirdly, as, as we've just implicated or indicated, is the voice of judgment. Verse 7, he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, uh, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Uh, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Babylon is a word that comes up in, uh, in the book of the Revelation. And it's something that sometimes people uh, are a little confused on. Let me give you just a simple understanding of Babylon. Babylon is God's name for the world system that the beast will uh, create uh, during the time of the tribulation. And there will be a world system. We've studied that. 
There, there'll be a world system of economy. There'll be a world system of, of politics. There'll be a world system of, of uh, religion. In Revelation 17, uh, Babylon is referred to as the harlot as far as the religious system is concerned. Uh, the beast uses uh, the harlot uh, or the religious aspect to accomplish his organization. This angel that has just spoken up now in uh, this verse is proclaiming that judgment on Babylon is coming and, and Babylon's going to be judged for her wickedness. How wicked was the evil empire or will the evil empire? empire of Babylon be. Now I'm going to read to you about how bad Babylon is and I want you as I'm reading it to you just a, a short passage I want you to be thinking to yourself how far from Babylon are we right now all right let's just do that in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 2 and he called out with a mighty voice fallen fallen is Babylon the great she has become a dwelling place for demons a haunt for every unclean spirit a haunt for every unclean bird a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast in other words, she's become a haven for all that's wicked in this world. Babylon has. Do you ever look at our, our country? Do you ever look at our community? And do you ever think to yourself, my soul, we're becoming a haven for all that's wicked in this world. Have you ever looked at, at the way that things are? Just in, and, and I'll tell you why we, we have sometimes a problem with that is because we're like the, the frog that gets put in the kettle when the water's cold. It feels fine to us, and then the water gets heated up until all of a sudden we've been cooked from the inside out. But the reality is that America and the world in general is closer to what Babylon's going to be than, than at any other time in our history. It continues to move on and on and on and on and on. Go to some of these public forums that we have here in town. Go down to the commission and, and, and speak against uh, one of these forums uh, or one of these issues that, that comes up in the Tallahassee uh, Council or Commission or the Leon County uh, Commission regarding special rights and, and this, that, and the other of groups that quite frankly unite based on one huge immorality. Go take a look at that. And see how that, that now the world has become afraid to cry out against sin. We're afraid to say that homosexuality is a sin against God. We're afraid to say that. But could I say this to you? For a long time we've been afraid to say that, uh, that adultery is a sin against God. You, you know what we've done? Uh, we, have, we have translated this society from a society that says be pure to a society that says be careful. That's where we're living in this society right now. And, and I'm telling you, we're just a few baby steps away from uh, Babylonian philosophy in the United States of America. We're right here. Babylon was evil, very evil, and the wickedness of the tribulation will not be overlooked in the judgment of God, and, and the wickedness of, of our world will not be overlooked in the judgment of God. I, I think there's, there's, and people ask me this. They said, do you think God's letting us go through this as a time of judgment because of the way that we've done this or that or the other? Well, I've got two answers for that. I don't know, and of course it is. Of course it is. Uh, the, the, many, many years ago, there was a, uh, a famous theologian in, in England who, who, his name was G.K. Chesterton, I believe, and uh, the, the, the newspaper there in London uh, put a, a contest out that for somebody to tell what's wrong with the world. And, and they were, and the best entry would gain some prize and, and uh, a monetary prize. And G.K. Chesterton uh, was, the, or C.K. Chesterton is the one uh, that won the prize. His response to what's wrong with the world was, I am. And that's pretty much what's wrong with the world. It's me. It's you. The black people used to sing, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my father, not my mother, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. What's going on in America today is, it's, is that we are gradually moving in the direction of, of what Babylon is going to become suddenly. 
And the reason is because it's me, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We're listening to voices that come in Revelation chapter 14. There is the voice of the kingdom. There is the voice of the gospel. There's the voice of praise. There's the, <laughs> the voice of uh, judgment. There is the voice of sentencing. In court you have a trial and a verdict and then comes the sentencing. Here is the sentence pronounced on those who are judged at the end of the tribulation. Revelation 14 and verse 9. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, uh, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, pours full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and, and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives uh, the mark of its name. Now this third message is aimed directly to those who are deciding about following the beast during the tribulation time. It is a warning that the easy way is really the hard way. The go along to get along uh, with the world way really means to go away from God. And that's what it means now. If you have that, well, I just have to go along to get along thing, typically, typically, here's what that means. I've got to go away from God to get along. Typically, that means I've got to leave the will of God in order to get along. Typically, that means I've got to do something that, that God be ashamed of me doing in order to get along. I'm just going along to get along. Those people during the tribulation, when they take the mark of the beast, when they take the seal of the beast, not to be confused with the mark of the Father, when they take the seal of the beast, there is no reversing it. There is no time to change. We're, we're uh, today, the, the, the biggest uh, craze, I guess, one of the biggest crazes, has to do with, with body art, tattoos and piercings and, and all those kinds of, of things. And, and back in the day, uh, back when, when I was much younger, you couldn't get those things off. You put them on, you couldn't get them off. And uh, they, they had to do some kind of a, like an operation thing. And I think there's a way to, to get them off now. I don't know whether there is or not. And this is not a message about tattoos. But, but the point that I'm making is this. That when, when someone takes the mark of the beast during the tribulation time, there is no reversing it. There is no going to Miami Inc. and say, could I get this thing taken off? There's none of that. It is there. It is a fate that is set, and remember, those who reject in this day of grace will be a part of that faith. Fate. There is eternal torment and no rest day or night. At this point, God will not mix mercy with judgment, but will pour out His undiluted indignation on a rebellious world. I know how good God's grace is, don't you? I know how good God's mercy is, don't you? I don't want to know how big God's wrath is. I just don't want to know it. Images like fire and sulfur and smoke have an upsetting effect on people. How can a God of love actually permit His creatures to suffer eternal torment? Some people ask. However, a God of love is pure and holy and, and, and His love is not based on sentimentality. He, he deals with sin justly, not emotionally. When, when the tormented saints of the tribulation ask for judgment and justice, for vengeance on their tormentors, a loving God answers their prayers. That's how that happens. And don't forget that God repeatedly warns sinners and gives them opportunity to repent. Hear me out. If, if you die without Jesus Christ, it is not God's fault. There is, there is enough gospel, if you put gospel in this bottle right here, there's enough gospel to save all of the world, past, present, and future, including you. You say, well, I just, I just don't think God could save me. I'm amazed at people who think, well, I've just lived such an awful life, God can't save me. How big do you think God is? He sent His only begotten Son to, to shed His precious blood on the cross of Calvary. And His precious blood is enough to save everybody in the world except you. As the late Dr. John R. Rice used to say, how foolish, how ridiculous. That's just crazy. 
Don't allow yourself to back yourself into a, a judgment corner where that you say, ooh, now I've, uh, the, Jesus really has come and taken his saints and this really is the tribulation that I'm in. Now I have to make a decision uh, between uh, uh, getting saved and taking the mark of the beast. Think I'll just go ahead and take the mark of the beast. It's easier to go along to get along. That's the way I've always lived. If people persist in their sins, even after God sends judgments and warnings, then they have only themselves to blame. The message here is simple. Better to reign with Christ forever than the Antichrist for seven years. Much better. Better to endure persecution patiently now and, uh, than to escape it and suffer throughout all of eternity. Well, I'm looking at seven voices. I've got to move on quickly to the voice number five. You've seen the voice of praise and the voice of the gospel and the voice of judgment and the voice of sentencing. Let's hear something wonderful, the voice of blessing. Let's, let's listen to that voice in Revelation 14. Verse 12. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and, and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead uh, who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed. Uh, indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, uh, for their deeds follow them. Now, these are the ones that re received a, a certain crown. Now, you, you say, is that applicable to us? Well, sure, it's applicable to us. The Bible says to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. That's not a punishment, it's a reward. However, there's a special blessing in the book of the Revelation called on a certain group of people who die. Who are those people? They're the ones that are referred to in Revelation 2 and verse 10. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be uh, tested. Uh, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. This is the blessing that's being referred to now in this fifth voice from heaven. Also interesting is that they are called blessed for being dead. It's the first time we've ever seen the Bible. Anybody just be called blessed, you're better off if you're dead. They're better off because of the persecution that they've known. And it's been so great. It's been so horrible. How horrible is it? So horrible that the angels of heaven cried out, you are blessed to now be dead. Instead of being back there. They're better off because their works are not forgotten and go with them. They're better off because they're no longer a part of that tormented world system that takes place during the tribulation. You say, Pastor Ray, I came to church today to get uplifted. You are bumming me out. <laughs> well, let me lift you up. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you're going to miss all this mess. Amen? Amen? I'm just showing you how good it is to be saved. There's some bad juju coming in, in the tribulation. It's not going to be good. Like the old country preacher said, however, I'm looking for the upper taker, not the undertaker. I'm looking at the bright side of all of this. And he said, well, I'm not saved. And so you're really bumming me out. I don't know for sure that I'm on my way to heaven. And you're saying all this stuff, and it's really getting to me. Well, I got good news for you. Whosoever will may come. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, but I'm that guy that said that nobody, everybody else could be saved, but I couldn't be saved. Guess what? You were mistaken. You could be saved, and you ought to be saved. Don't let yourself die without Jesus Christ. Don't do that. God loves you. God gave his son to die on the cross for your sins. You, you are a sinful person, as am I, and you cannot earn your way to heaven. There is nothing good inside of you to the point that God can say, that's the ticket. You come on up. You don't need my son, Jesus. We all need Jesus, and we can all have Jesus. You mean I can have him? Oh, yeah, you can have him. Let me give you the Sixth voice, very quickly. That's the voice of harvest. You say, oh, I like that. I love the sound of harvest. Well, hang on, we're talking about tribulation here. This is a different kind of harvest. Revelation 14 and verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud seated on the cloud like the Son of Man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. 
He's not the lamb here. He is not in the glory of his coming, but he is the reaper holding a sickle ready to harvest. That is God. He's ready to harvest and he has the right to harvest. It is a judgment harvest. And the angel now calls for it in verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the the hour to reap has come for the harvest of earth is fully ripe. What are they talking about here? They're talking about what it sounds like. The angel's not causing the harvest. He's just giving the message to the Father regarding the time has, that's been anticipated for so long. And with the thrusting end of the sickle, the vine of the earth is gathered. And finally, there is the voice of Armageddon. This is what everybody thinks that they're hearing today with nuclear meltdown. This is what everybody thinks they're hearing today with earthquakes and volcanoes and tornadoes and, and hurricanes and, and, and catastrophes worldwide. They think they're hearing the voice of Armageddon. Here's the voice of Armageddon in Revelation 14 and verse 16. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came from the altar, and the angel uh, who has authority over fire. And he called with a loud voice to one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters for the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his uh, sickle across the earth and gathered the great uh, harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden out the city, and the blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. That's some nasty stuff. Let me just say this. If you go... To, you know that, that we're looking at trying to go to Israel next June. If you go to Israel, we will try to visit that valley where this, this whole thing will take place and they talk about the, the, the blood flowing. We'll, we'll try to visit that. And, and when, when I visited it and they said, this is where the, the blood is going to flow up to the horse's bridle, I said, oh my goodness, oh my soul, what horror there will be Today, the, the, the place, excuse me, the, the beast and his circle and, and his system, his world are gathered on the earth or from the earth, and the wine press, press is the fierceness and the wrath of an almighty God. Verse 15 said, from his mouth comes a sharp sword and with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God. God the Almighty. The place is the place Revelation 16, 16 calls Armageddon. The person pictured here on the white horse is undoubtedly our Lord Jesus Christ in the pictures of the final judgment of the world. God has permitted the seeds of iniquity to grow until they're ripe and then he judges. Well, he, he brings in his sickle. He said, I see the seeds of iniquity now. It's kind of like the weeds growing up. I, I've got some uh, some boxwoods in the front of my house, and, and uh, there's, there's sometimes there's this vine that grows up, and, and I'll come and see those boxwoods all trimmed so pretty and nice, and, and then I'll say, what is that sticking up? And it's this, this wild uh, weed that has come up uh, tall enough for me to see. And you know what I get to do when I see it's tall enough for me to see? I get me some gloves because it's sticky and I, uh, uh, stickery, and I reach down in there, and I pull that thing up because it is now grown enough to be judged by me. There's coming a day when the the root of iniquity has produced such a plant and such a fruit that God himself says, oh, I can see it all now. And he takes his sickle and he he cuts it off. Today, Christ is the vine and the believers are the branches to him. Today, God is speaking to the world in grace and men will not listen. One day, he must speak in wrath. The bitter cup will be emptied and the harvest of sin reaped and the vine of the earth cut down and cast into the wine press. And this will be Armageddon. It is the time when the earth is drunk with blood. It is the time when the Antichrist it is defeated. It is the time that you want to read about in the headlines of heaven, not experience in real time on this earth. I want to tell you something. I've told you many times over that I got saved when I was eight years old. 
And I think that I've communicated this to you, and if I haven't, I'm going to communicate it to you very, very clearly right now. now. I'm 61 years old, so that means I've been saved a long time, all right? Long, long time. Thank God I've been saved a long, long time. Do you know why I got saved when I was eight? Very, very simple. Because you want to give your heart to Jesus and serve him? No, 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 no. No. Because my daddy was a hell fire and brimstone preacher. And the last thing, I can, I can hear my daddy now. I, I, I saw my daddy one time strike a match at the pulpit of the church and hold that thing up and said, anybody want to come here and put your finger to the end of this? See how long you can stand it? Oh, come on, Daddy. He said, could I tell you this? This is nothing compared to the torments of hell. And could I tell you something? I got saved for one reason and one reason only. I did not want to go to hell. Period. I can still see my daddy with those matches. I can still see him begging somebody to come up and touch the end of the flame with their finger, and they wouldn't do it. And I can remember that, that pit inside of me that kept turning and churning and saying, oh boy, you need to be saved. So I don't think you ought to scare a kid like that. I'm going to tell you something. I'm delighted that when I was 11 years old, I got the hell scared out of me. Just absolutely delighted. Some of you should have had it scared out of you earlier because now you've become hardened to it. Now you think you can get by. You don't have to believe me, but you must believe God. And Jesus himself said, you must be born You have been watching the Family Bible Hour, a ministry of North Florida Baptist Church in Tallahassee, Florida. If you would like a copy of today's message on CD or DVD, write to us at Family Bible Hour, 3000 North Meridian Road, Tallahassee, Florida, 32312. Visit us online at nflchurch.com or call us at 850-385-7181. Join us again next time for the Family Bible Hour.